Also spirit. What's up, guys? We're back. Hopefully, we get the same number of people in Jesus' name. <clears throat> we love you, Father, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you. Give us the grace and the power and the filling of your Holy Spirit. Father, please, we ask in Jesus' name, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, fill us with your eternal, glorious, majestic, beautiful Spirit, the eternal Spirit of the Father, your Spirit. <clears throat> and wash us in your precious blood, Lord Jesus. Cleanse us in your precious blood, Lord Jesus. Purify us in your precious blood, Lord Jesus, the blood of the Lamb. You are the Father's heart who became flesh. <clears throat> you are his eternally beloved, our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Father, I ask that you bless Lord Jesus, I ask you bless. Holy Spirit, I ask that you bless this session. Bless everyone who will come and listen to it and strengthen us, Father. Lord Jesus, strengthen us. Holy Spirit, strengthen us. One God, the Father, his eternal Son, his eternal Spirit. One God, the Father, his eternal Son, his eternal Spirit. In Jesus' name, Yehovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Watch over us, Father. Lord Jesus, watch over us. Holy Spirit, fill me. Anoint me. Enable me to recall the passages and interpret them correctly and perfectly by your power. Purify my motives to do it for the glory and honor of Jesus, not for the praise of men. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, fill everyone. Clothe everyone, Holy Spirit. Seal everyone that comes. Seal me for the glory of Jesus Christ and our loved ones, whether the elderly, our siblings, spouses, children. In my case, my children. Seal them and wash them in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Give me the health I need, please, Holy Spirit, to do these sessions and strengthen my voice and my lungs and my chest. And give everyone eyes to see and ears to hear for the glory of Jesus. May Jesus increase in us. May we decrease and use these sessions, Holy Spirit, to convict Muslims to fall in love with the true Jesus, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, and save us from attacks of the enemy. And bless the connection, please. Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit, we ask. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Yehovah, Father, Son, Spirit, we love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. In Jesus' almighty name, amen. Okay, folks, welcome. XX Phillips, I thought I saw that you posted 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. I don't know. It's going, Stephen Universe. I let the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> take care of me and everyone else and preserve me and everyone else for his glory. He watches over us. Here's a question. I saw XX Phillips. You posted 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 8. You posted on the Discord. <clears throat> what made you post that verses? Isocamp, huh? Isocamp. Why is that name familiar? You read up on Works News. Okay, good. But yeah, we're just waiting for first and last Protestant. I don't know if they're here and people on Discord. Are they on? Hopefully they're on. <clears throat> Are they here? Okay. You guys asked for it. Hopefully we'll get the same number. In fact, even more. And then I will open up the Q&A. <clears throat> You'd be a machine, mate. You too, Cloudy. You're a machine. Anyway, I'll open up the Q&A because I want to answer the question. Okay, praise God, XX Phillips, because I think, you know, you meant to try to, you know, rebuke me in love. Remember, my love is tough. I don't hold records of wrongs, and I love you, bro. All right? Kind, but also tough. So keep it up, XX Phillips, so I can show you tough love. No, I'm just kidding. That's the word of God. May the power of the Holy Spirit ingrain and engrave the word of God, the scriptures in our hearts and our souls and our beings and our minds before our eyes and our tongues to live them out for the glory of Jesus Christ. All right. Okay, guys, you wanted me to answer the question, what is the true religion according to the Holy Bible, the scriptures? <clears throat> right? That's what you guys want me to do? No, it's the leather jacket because it's a little cold in here, but I don't know how it is outside. All right? In fact, with that said, let me get something. Protestant, you here, bro? First and last, you here? I started a session. They're not here. Well, that's okay. I'm going to have to quote by myself. Oh, you're here? Okay, brother. God bless you. I thought you're not here. First and last left, too? Let me see. Should I get something to drink? Yeah, let me get my drink. Hold on, guys. See, this is life. This is beautiful, man. You can walk. You can talk. You can hear me. We were sailing along. On a light day. All right. Okay, folks. <clears throat> You guys asked me, you guys asked me to show you what the true religion is according to God's true word, his only inscripturated revelation, written word, the Holy Bible. How are you, Isaac? 
Because according to the Quran, according to the Quran, the religion of the God of Abraham is Islam. This is in the first part of the session. So please make sure you hear the first part of the session. And I'm trusting Holy Spirit to guide me to represent the Islamic sources correctly, right? So I don't misinterpret. But the Quran says that the religion of mankind, the religion of the prophets, the religion of Abraham, the religion of Jesus' disciples, right? Their religion is Islam. And I defined what it meant. And they even tried to hijack the Holy Bible to prove it. And we went into some examples and we refuted it, right? So now, from a Christian perspective, from a Christian perspective, what is the religion prescribed by God? What is the way of life prescribed by God? Because religion is not just ritual, right? It's a way of life. It governs your life. It tells you how to live a life pleasing to your creator for whom you exist. And our creator is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The one true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Bible is God's inscripturated revelation telling us how to live for the glory of the Father, for the glory of the Lord Jesus, the Father, Son, for the glory of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Right? Everyone with me there? You following so far? Hope you're up. Hope you're not tired. Right? So religion is not just ritual. It's a comprehensive way of life. What is the religion prescribed to us? What is what is its name? Because, by the way, <clears throat> that's another objection by the late Ahmed Idad. If you watch his debates, he'll tell you the word Christian is man-made. The word Judaism, man-made. Hinduism, man-made. These are names that men came up with. These are names coined by men, not inspired by God, not authorized by God. To use these names to describe their way of life. This is an objection, so I need you to listen. And I hope people on Discord are listening. Protestant, are they all there listening? Daughter of Christ, all of them? Are they ready? Because this is another objection of Islam. And I wrote an article on this. Okay. Do remind me to share the links and give you the links. All right. Yeah, everyone checked out. They're tired. That's okay. Be that as it may. I have some links that I want to pass on and share with you before I end the session. Links where you can read, right? There's further material. Now, <clears throat> yo, what's up? One of the objections again is, Islam, at least the Quran claims, even though you may not believe the Quran is the word of God, the Quran claims that Allah named the followers Muslims and named the religion Islam. That's at least the Quran says that. You may not accept the Quran, but at least if you're a Muslim, you can see this name comes from God according to the Quran. You may reject the claim, but at least it makes that claim. So then the challenge for everyone here is, where did you get the name Christian from? Was that something re revealed to you by God? In your book, which you believe is from God, did God say, name yourselves Christian? At least my book claims that's what my God did, named me Islam. Named the religion Islam, named, the relig <clears throat> named me Muslim. Named the religion Islam, <clears throat> and named me Muslim. Does your Bible at least claim that? Does your Bible make the claim? That you should call yourself Christian, the religion is Christianity. Right? You understand the objection? Because I'm going to kill two birds with one stone, maybe even more. I'm going to show you what the true religion is according to the Bible, the religion of even the Old Testament saints, the religion of all true believers and the true God, whose word is the Bible, not the Quran. I'm going to show you that and respond to this objection at the same time. So the question is this. The term Christian, was that given to you by God? Did God say, call yourself Christian? Yeah, well, to them they'll say, at least you can ascribe the name of your religion, your way of life, to the creator and not to uninspired men. Men who are not inspired or authorized to give you the name of the religion. <clears throat> right? Does anyone understand what the point is, the objection is? So now you guys are saying no. <clears throat> Make sure I give you the links to these articles because there are a couple I want to give you links to before I we end the session. Actually, you'd be wrong. The Bible does tell you <clears throat> what the name of your faith is, what your name should be, and it <clears throat> it's given to you by the authority of God, by revelation of God through the men he authorized and inspired. 
According to the Bible, you are to bear the name Christian. According to the Bible, you are to call yourself a Christian because that's the name God has given you. <clears throat> that's the name God has given you. So are you ready now for the evidence? Are you guys ready for the evidence? Yes. Riaz, and I'll revisit that in a minute because there's a common myth, <clears throat> misinterpretation of Acts 11, 26. Okay. Let's go to 1 Peter 4, verse 14. Let's start with that. <clears throat> I don't know why my voice is now sticky. <clears throat> Christos Anesti, which part of Christian wasn't clear? The Christ or the Ian? That's the name. Others called them the followers of the way or the sect of the Nazarene. That's what others call them, which is fine. You can call yourself the followers of the way because Jesus is the way, right? And you are the sect of the Nazarene. You're the sect that belongs to Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth being the founder of the sect. But let's go to 1 Peter 4.14 before the rapture. I don't know what's going on. Are they here? Protestant first last. You guys are here? I don't know if you guys are here. Okay, 1 Peter 4.14. Guys, pay attention first. If you be uh, northeast, you don't like it, get lost. I'm concerned why. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, notice, <clears throat> if you get persecuted, if you get insulted, if you suffer for the name of Christ, for the sake of Christ's name, happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. They speak ill and evil of our Lord Jesus Christ. But on your part, he is glorified. Okay, now, let me explain this passage. I need you to listen now. I feel like you guys probably are checked out. You're too tired. You don't want to listen, right? But if you're up for it, I'll, I'll keep teaching, right? So do you see what he says? If you suffer, if you're persecuted, if you're attacked, imprisoned, you lose your job, your family, even killed, <clears throat> for Christ's sake, the name of Christ, for the sake of Christ's name, <clears throat> you are happy, you are blessed. Why? The Spirit of God rests upon you. That's, that's a sign. God's Spirit is upon you. God's spirit indwells you. <clears throat> God's spirit <clears throat> seals you, right? That you are born of God's spirit. But also, <clears throat> the spirit of glory is on you. Don't, don't ask me why my voice is upset now. Okay? What does it mean, the spirit of glory? What does it mean, this is a sign that the spirit of glory is on you? Yes, it does mean the Holy Spirit is glorious. The glorious spirit of, of God, because he is glorious and majestic. But it means something else. What does it mean that this is a sign that the spirit of glory is on you? Someone help me. Come on. Let's see who's listening. Seems like a lot of people checked out. What does it mean the spirit of glory is on you? What does it mean the spirit of glory? Apart from the Holy Spirit is glorious. What's its meaning? Come on, guys. Think with me. That's all I'm going to know. You're following with me. You're not tired. Because if you guys are tired, honestly, I'll just, you know, shut down. No, not the glory of God, Jesus Christ, no. Say, so Christian, got it. The spirit of glory means <clears throat> that you will be glorified. The, the spirit of God, God's spirit, has destined you for glory. This is a sign you will enter glory. You'll be glorified. You'll be made glorious. That's your destiny in Christ. Your destiny in Christ isn't that you're going to die and cease to exist. Your union with Christ doesn't result in your condemnation. Your destiny is you will be glorified. You will enter glory and be made glorious, and you will behold the glory of Jesus. Okay, but this still doesn't tell us that we should be called Christian. So why did I quote 1 Peter 4.14? Because the connection of the name of Christ, the connection with the name of Christ, if you suffer for the name of Christ, for Christ's name's sake, know that's a sign God's spirit lives in you and your destiny is glory, not destruction, not death, because you will be glorified. Now, what does it mean, suffer for the name of Christ? You don't need to guess because 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, same chapter, same chapter, verse 16, same chapter, verse 16. Same chapter, verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, 
As a Muslim, no. As a Buddhist, no. As a Hindu, no. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. There you go. Here is an inspired book written by an inspired spokesperson, spokesperson of Christ, an apostle, the apostle Peter, using a scribe, an amanuensis, using Silvanus, Silas, to write these words that the Holy Spirit is giving him to write and preserve. Here is an inspired proclamation. God wants you to bear the name Christian. Not Islam, not Muslim, not Hinduism, not Hindu, not Buddhist, not Buddhism. Christian. Glorify God in that name, that label, but live up to the label. Don't call yourself a Christian and dishonor the Lord. Don't call yourself a Christian and sin against the Lord. Don't call yourself a Christian and panic and freak out because of the epidemic. Don't shame Jesus by calling yourself a Christian and living a life contrary to the will of Christ. Right? But is the name Christian given to us by revelation of God? Yes, Sal. The English is an accurate translation of the word in Greek, Christianos. There's no need to even ask me that. Right? Is this proof that your own scripture revealed by God tells you this is your name? Your name is Christian. Right? Did you get it that far? Thus far? Now, let's go to Acts 26, 28 to 29. The term Christian appears three times in the inspired New Testament, scriptures of our God, three times. Here in Acts 26, 28 to 29. <clears throat> Acts 26, 28 to 29. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Muslim. No. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Hindu. No. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Buddhist. No. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You've almost got me convinced to be a Christian, Paul. Paul, what in the world are you doing trying to make him a Christian? Why don't you make him a Jew religiously or a Muslim religiously? Why are you persuading him by the power of the Holy Spirit to be a Christian? And does Paul say, no, man, that's not what I'm trying to make you become. What's wrong with you? And Paul said, I would be God that not only thou, not only you, but also all that hear me this day, all are hearing me. We're both almost and all together such as I am except these bonds. That's what I want for every one of you, not just you, Agrippa, everyone listening, all of them. I want them to be like me, except these chains, because Paul was in prison in chains when he says that. I don't want you to be in prison. I don't want you to be locked up, but I want you to be like me, a Christian, a follower of Christ, because Christianus means a Christ follower, imitator of Christ, right? Is that clear? So you got two examples, 1 Peter 4.16. And Acts 26, 28, 29. Now, let me briefly address Acts 11, 26, because it's often exactly simple. It's often misinterpreted, misunderstood. Acts 11, 26. This is the first occurrence chronologically in the Bible, because if you follow the list of the books, we start with Matthew. Acts is before 1 Peter. So this is the first recorded instance of the word Christian, chronologically speaking, right? Meaning in the order of the books in your New Testament. And the, and the listing of the books in your New Testament. Unless you start from Revelation and we read backwards, that's a different story. Acts eleven twenty six, And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So the first time they were called Christians was in Antioch, Syria. In Antioch, Syria, they were called Christians. And Bill Shepard, thank you for showing that you have bought into a tradition, a lie. No, they weren't. That's what I was going to ask you. Bill Shepard, I will give you a million bucks. Show me they were called Christians by way of mockery by unbelievers. Where does the verse say that? That was the tradition I was referring to that people bought into. That's a lie. Show me that. Thank you. I was going to ask, but you, you said it. Where do you see Bill Shepard, anyone else, that's a, that says they were called Christians by outsiders by way of mockery? 
Where does it say that? 10 million bucks. I don't have 10 million bucks, but go ahead. Show me that. Thank you, Christos. Praise God. Because your pastors or someone told you that, that's not true. There's nothing in Acts 11.26. I don't know what you're talking about. Jesus Christ is the Lord. You're talking to me? There's nothing in Acts 11.26 that says they were called Christians by unbelievers. Nothing. In fact, this is what we call a divine passive. The context actually shows they were called Christians not by unbelievers, but by God through the inspired prophets and apostles. After all, if we read 27 to 29, we're going to read now Acts 11, 27 to 30. Okay, Acts 11, 27, 30. When they were called Christians, there were prophets and apostles like Paul, receiving revelation from God, inspired by the Spirit. And in those days, what days? The days they were in Antioch when they were called Christians. So in those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up on one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit. So they're receiving direct revelation, fresh revelation from the Holy Spirit that there should be great death throughout the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent into the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Side note, the Holy Spirit already prepared them for this disaster, a famine. But they didn't panic, they didn't freak out, because they knew Jesus is alive, Almighty would preserve them. So they gathered together and called their resources to help those in need to overcome the famine. And that's how we need to be in this panic for the glory of Jesus. Okay? Everything good? It's not buffering because I Christians buffering from, right? But with me, it's okay. You guys can see me? Tell Sai it's him. It's not me. Praise God for your church. Okay. Now, folks, don't let anyone else tell you they, that believers were called Christians by unbelievers as by way of mockery. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's nothing in that chapter to show that the term Christian was given upon believers by way of mockery. In fact, if you read it carefully and you read it accurately and contextually, they were called Christians by revelation of God, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, which Peter confirms in 1 Peter 4.16. Because we believe Peter is writing down an inspired letter, inspired by the Spirit, writing down the words that the Holy Spirit wants him to write down. Let's see what he says again. I started with that, but we're going to look at it again. 1 Peter 4.16. 1 Peter 4.16. Blessings. Hopefully you're going to get that 150 again. I just like it when it's over 100. My ego. No, the Lord save me from myself. First Peter 4, 16, one more time. Peter, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Did you catch it? Peter is inspired. The Spirit told him to write these words in a letter preserved by the Spirit for the building up of the church. Okay? So you have three references to the term Christian. One, once it's in plural... And nothing in any of those references suggests that the term Christian was coined by uninspired men by way of mocking the church. All the evidence shows that term was given by God himself through revelation. Is that clear? <clears throat> Is that clear? Jonathan, re start from the beginning and try to work your way up here because you missed about 10, 15 minutes. No, actually more than that. Yeah. Luis and everyone else getting it? You guys are getting it, right? So, to answer the question, did God name true followers Muslims? No. Did God name true followers Jews? No. Buddhists? No. He named the true followers Christian. Christians. And I've given you proof. But now, now, what about the Old Testament saints? Because the Quran says 
Abraham was a Muslim. They're all Muslims. So what about the Old Testament saints before Christ? Because when I say religion, I'm not just talking about ritual. By religion, I mean a way of life, a pattern of life, a way of life that governs the way you worship, ritual, as well as governs your social, political, economic, military, marital life. It governs all your life. A pattern of life that tells you how to live in every aspect of your life, religiously, economically, maritally. And that's what Christianity is. It's a comprehensive way of life. Why do you think you have 27 books in the New Testament that tell, tell you how to treat your spouse, your children, your parents, your employees, your employers, how to treat the governments, what your responsibilities are, and so on and so forth. Comprehensive way of life, not just how you worship on Sunday. So now the question is, what was the religion of the Old Testament's prophets and saints? What was their religion? Now, before I look into that, let me reread what the Quran says in chapter 3, verse 67. Chapter 3, verse 67. Guys, remind me to give you some articles before I'm done. Chapter 3, verse 67, and I'm going to open up the Q&A, Lord willing, because this shouldn't take me too long. Chapter 3, verse 67. Let's see, I want to read it because I don't know if these guys can get it on time. Did they? Oh, thank you. First and last got it. Okay, 367. Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but was one inclining toward truth, a Muslim, and he was not of the polytheist. So the Old Testament saints, starting with Abraham, they were Muslim. Do you see that? They were Muslim, right? That's what the Quran claims. But the Quran is not the word of God. It's a book inspired by Satan. So from the Christian perspective, what was Abraham? What was Isaac? What was David? Before I answer that, let me show you another reference from the Quran. Chapter 3, verse 65. Chapter 3, verse 65. Okay, read here. O people of Scripture, Ahlul Kitab. When the Quran says, O people of Scripture, it's referring to Jews and Christians. So here the Quran is talking to Jews and Christians, us. You people of the Scripture, you whom God has given a Scripture, revelation to. Why do you argue about Abraham while the Torah and the Gospel are not revealed unto after him? Then will you not reason? So notice the claim of the Quran. Two claims, folks. And make sure you're getting it and I'm not confusing you. Two claims. Claim number one, Abraham wasn't a Jew or a Christian. He's a Muslim, an upright Muslim. Claim number two, the Torah of Moses, the revelation given to Moses, and the gospel of Jesus Christ was given after Abraham. Abraham didn't have the gospel, nor did he have the Torah, nor was he a Jew, nor was he a Christian. Okay, everyone got that thus far? Everyone got what the Quran says. Now, are you ready to expose the Quran for its lies and glorify the triune God, glorify Jesus Christ, and see how amazing the Bible is. Are you ready? Are you now ready to see how amazing the Bible is? Thank you, JSB. Ethnically, not a Jew. There you're wrong. Abraham's the father of the Jews. So no, ethnically, he's not a Jew. That's a mistake. He's the father of the Jews. But it's okay. The first part, you're right. Okay. Let's see. Was the gospel preached after Abraham? Or was the gospel preached to Abraham? Galatians 3, verse 8, but we're going to read 7 to 9. Galatians 3, verse 8, but we're going to read 7 to 9. Get ready to go into meat now. You ask for it, and people are starting to roll in. Know you, therefore, that they which are of faith, those who believe, have trust in God. The same are the children of Abraham, your child Abraham. And the Scripture foreseeing, the Scripture seeing in advance, the Scripture seeing in advance, that God would justify, declare righteous, make righteous the heathen, meaning Gentiles, those who are not ethnically Jews. And he would make them righteous and declare them righteous through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Bam! The gospel was preached unto Abraham. Okay, sorry. In Jesus' name, may the buffering disappear. Did you catch it? Did you see Galatians 3, 8? One more time. Galatians 3, verse 8. Don't worry. It's going to buff. Let 
Is it working, guys? Is it working now? All right. Okay, guys. I don't know. Hopefully, the buffering won't get worse in Jesus' name. I think it's maybe because people are now on the Internet. All right. Notice every time at a salient point, something happens to distract us. But we are covered by the blood of Jesus. We have victory in the cross of Jesus over against Satan who's been crushed under the feet of Jesus. Galatians 3.8, one more time. Galatians 3.8, one more time. Okay. And the scripture foreseeing that... Anyway. The scripture foreseeing... That God would justify the Gentiles, those who are not Jews ethnically, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Did you guys catch it? Was the gospel preached to Abraham before Jesus became flesh and blood from the womb of his blessed mother Mary while she was a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit? So that means the Quran is a lie. That means Paul already refuted the lie of the Quran before Muhammad ever showed up isn't it amazing how the bible has all the answers even to the claims of the quran even before the quran came into being isn't it amazing the bible paul wrote this 600 years before the quran and he's already refuting an argument of the quran before the quran even appeared he's already telling us the gospel was preached to abraham so much for your claim, Muhammad. So we already had the refutation to your claim. Our book, The True Word of God, already exposed you as a liar and a son of Satan, even before you showed up. We were told to expect someone like you and use this sword, the sword of the Spirit, the word, to expose you. <clears throat> right? Everyone got it? Now, let's show. Let me now give you the proof that... Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, they were all, they were all Christians. Because what, what do I mean by Christian? Follower of Christ, a believer in Christ, a lover of Christ, someone who loved Jesus, followed Jesus, trust in Jesus, and hoped in Jesus. They were Christians, even though they didn't use the name, that's what they were. Because a Christian is a follower of Christ. Can I now prove it to you? Are you guys ready? You ready for the proof? <clears throat> okay. Remember I said this builds off, builds builds upon what we discussed yesterday. John 8, 56. John 8, 56. Remember my session, Jesus, the God of Abraham? This builds upon it because someone even noted it yesterday. Oh, so Abraham was a Christian, one of the commenters. Yes, because look what our Lord said, John 8, 56. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Can I ask you guys a question? Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw my day and was glad. Doesn't this mean Abraham knew about Jesus, believed in Jesus, trusted in Jesus, and hoped in Jesus before Jesus became flesh? So doesn't this mean he was a Christian then? So when you're asked the question, what was Abraham? He wasn't religiously a Jew, nor was he ethnically a Jew. The Jews came later. Nor was he a Muslim, but according to Jesus, who left the tomb empty, who rose physically, bodily, making his physical body indestructible, who's alive and will return physically, bodily. He is risen. He is Lord. He says Abraham was a Christian. So are you going to believe rabbinic Jews, secular agnostic atheists, Muslims, or are you going to believe the risen Lord of glory and his word, the Holy Bible? Okay, but wait, wait. John 5, 45, 47. John 5, 45, 47. John 5, 45, 47. Okay. John 5, 45 to 47. We're going to have to add a subtitle to this. Sunni Islamic Beliefs Critique Part 2. What was the religion of the prophets? Now notice what our Lord says here, guys. Day means the day in which Jesus revealed himself to Abraham, both by appearing to him and making known to him his coming, sort of truth. The day in which Jesus revealed himself to Abraham, both by appearing to him and announcing his coming, meaning coming as the Messiah, both. Him appearing to him 
as God and then announcing to him the coming Messiah. The day in which Jesus made himself known to Abraham and revealed to him the prophecy of the coming one. Okay, now, John 5, 45, 47, who happens to be Jesus. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. <clears throat> for had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So wait, Jesus, Moses wrote of you? Yes. But how can he write about you, Jesus, if Moses didn't know who you were? So you're telling me Moses knew who you, who you were and wrote of you? And you're coming as Messiah? Yes. So Abraham and Moses were Christians. A Abraham and Moses were Christians, according to the words of our Lord Jesus. Are you catching this or no? God bless you too. I don't know why I'm a tough guy, but Lord bless you, Beanie. Okay, you're there? Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. Hebrews 11, 24, 26. I hope you're being blessed. You're enjoying this. And it's like blowing you away. Like, wow. Exciting you by the power of the Spirit. Because we're going to take it nice and slow. Because there's a lot of information for me to unpack. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction... <clears throat> With the people of God, then to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now notice 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect unto the rec recompense of the reward. Now because it's old English, you're not getting the meat of Hebrews 11.26. Let's look at Hebrews 11.26 in the NIV or ESV. Why did Moses reject the riches of Egypt? Why did Moses reject his status as a son of Pharaoh, a prince? Why did he give up earthly wealth, earthly possessions, earthly fame to suffer with the people of God? Read it, Hebrews eleven twenty six. 26. What translation is that? He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. NIV, brother. Give me NIV. They're all clear, but I just want to make sure you're getting it. NIV. Sometimes NIV serves as an excellent paraphrase to bring out the meaning. Right? NIV. Watch here. Exactly how Stark. We're all in quarantine. Pay attention. I hope Luis is being blessed because I want the newbies to be blessed. Really. This is new stuff for them. By faith. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. There you go. Bam. So Paul, tradition says Paul wrote this using a scribe, perhaps Luke. Paul says, you know why Moses gave up his status, his fame, his fortune, his position, his wealth? Gave up being a prince of Egypt, a son of Pharaoh? He did it for the sake of Jesus Christ. He chose to be disgraced for Jesus' sake. Wait, wait. How can Moses have chosen to give up his riches, his status, and accepted suffering and being disgraced for the sake of Christ without him knowing that he was doing it for Christ? And if he knew he was doing it for Christ, doesn't that mean he knew about Christ? Before I move on? Are you seeing it? So Jesus and Hebrews confirm Moses knew about Jesus, wrote about Jesus, and did it all for Jesus' sake. The Messiah, the Christ, who is Jesus. Everyone get in because I don't want to move on yet. <clears throat> okay. All right. What else do we learn from scriptures as the Holy Spirit enables me to call this information? Now. Let's go to Luke 24, 44 to 45. Luke 24, 44 to 45. Yes, but I'd have to unpack Genesis 22, and it's more than just 22, 12. If you guys want, I will unpack Genesis 22 real quickly. I have articles on Genesis 22 and sessions on Genesis 22. 
but I'll unpack it real quickly. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scripture. So wait, Moses, the prophets and the Psalms wrote concerning Jesus. Moses, the prophets and the Psalms wrote concerning Jesus. They spoke of the coming of Jesus, who's the Messiah, and they spoke of his sufferings. They spoke of his resurrection. They spoke of his entering glory. They all did that. The prophets all did that. All right. Romans 1 verse 2. Romans 1 verse 2. Romans 1 verse 2. Which he had promised aforetime by his scriptures, by his holy prophets, his prophets and holy scriptures. What did God promise before time in the writings, holy writings of the prophets? Let's read 3 and 4. Romans 1, 2. God promised in advance beforehand in the holy writings of the prophets. He moved the prophets to write in their holy writings by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. About who? Verses 3 and 4. Let's see. About who? Let's see. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Wait, the prophets in their holy writings wrote concerning the son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who would be made of the seed of David when he became flesh from his blessed mother and the power of the Holy Spirit while she was a virgin. And also his resurrection from the dead with power from the, by the Holy Spirit? Is that what you just read? Wow. Luke 24, 25, 27. Jesus said that before Paul did. Luke 24, 25 to 27. I hope this is not boring you because I'm giving you verse after verse after verse to establish this point. Verse after verse after verse to establish this point. Then he said unto them, O foolish, this is Jesus speaking, the Lord speaking. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Wasn't Christ predestined to suffer these things before he could enter his glory, his glorious reign? Wasn't this already predetermined? Well, how do we know it's predetermined? 25, right? Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Okay, now I'm getting confused. This means all the prophetic writings, the Old Testament, knew about the Messiah, knew he would come, knew he would suffer for their salvation before he entered his glorious reign. They all knew it. Well, how could they know all know all that, know all this, without knowing that their salvation came from this Messiah that they're writing about? That their salvation, their hope, their glorification comes from this one who comes to save them all. So they all knew that? They're aware of this? They're aware it's the Messiah who saves them. It's the Messiah who preserved them and blessed them and glorified them. And so their hope of salvation, their trust is in the Messiah and his work. They all knew that according to the words of Jesus himself and his followers. Anyone not getting this? Or is everyone getting this? Before I move on to the next point. All right. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Because life, I feel like I torture people. God's word is not boring, but you can be, like meaning me. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Yep, he acted out in the Aqidah, which we mentioned in part 1. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, 
Here's the gospel I'm preaching to you, by which all else also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Wait, wait. The only scriptures would be the Old Testament. So he says, Christ died for our sins like the scriptures announced. The scriptures said Christ would die for our sins. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to scriptures. So wait, Paul. You're saying the Old Testament prophesied the death of Messiah for our sins and he'd be raised to life? Yes. Pronounced, prophesied, declared in the writings of the prophets. So that means the prophets knew Messiah would die for their sins and save them. And God wouldn't leave him dead, but raise him to life? Yes. So if they knew that, that means they're hoping in Messiah. And they knew Messiah was their savior? Yes. So they're trusting in Messiah? Yes. Oh, so they were Christians. Excellent. They were Christians. You catch it? Everyone getting at this? Man, I can go on like this over and over and over and over and over and over. It's all throughout the New Testament. Matthew to Revelation, they keep repeating this. The law and the prophets, Moses and the prophets, they all announce these things. They all proclaim the coming of the Messiah, his suffering for our salvation, his resurrection, and then glorification. They all spoke of it. Some were given more details than others, but one thing they all knew some were given more details than others, but one thing they all knew. Messiah's coming. He saves us. Our hope is in him. Our trust is in him, and we love him, Messiah. You hear me there? All right? Acts 17, verses 1 to 4, specifically verses 2 and 3. Acts 17, verses 1 to 4, specifically verses 2 and 3. Exactly, Louisa Campbell. Watch here. Acts 17, verse 1 to 4, specifically verses 2 to 3. Read. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollo, Apollo, uh, Apollonia, 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 they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, his custom, went in unto them, went into the synagogue to preach to the Jews. And three Sabbath days for three weeks, Reason with them out of the scriptures, the Torah, the prophets, the writings. Reason with them with the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Watch. Okay. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So he took the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. He goes, let me show you, Jews. Where it says Messiah would die for our sins and that God would raise him to life and then be glorified. Let me show you. You see it? Yeah. He's come. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. That's our Messiah. Verse 4. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and the chief woman, not a few. Did you catch it? He's showing the Jews... Look, it's been in our Bible all this time. The Hebrew Bible told us Messiah would die to save us, would be raised and glorified, made immortal, and then enter into his king, kingly glory. Right? See? Abraham saw me, was glad. Right? Abraham saw me, was glad. Moses wrote about me. Moses gave up his riches, his fame, his, his status, his station in life. Gave up his status as a prince of Egypt for my sake. For my sake. He knew it was better to experience pain and suffering and disgrace for his love for Jesus Christ than it was to gain the world and lose Christ. Right? Now this one, I'm going to need the NIV. Are you ready? NIV. Are you ready for the NIV, Protestant? Okay. John 12, 37 to 38. We're going to break it down into two sections. 
John 12, 37, 38, first section. Guys, pay attention here. Did Isaiah know about Jesus? Did Isaiah speak about Jesus? Did Isaiah believe in Jesus? John 12, 37, 38, guys, read. It's explaining why the Jews rejected Jesus in spite of the miracles he did. Jesus did miracles and they still didn't accept him. Notice why. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Understand what John just told you. Isaiah was told in advance and he wrote this down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When Messiah comes, he's going to do miracles, but the Jews will still not believe in him. Wait, 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 John. You're telling me Isaiah knew that? Isaiah knew the Messiah, who's the arm of the Lord, would come and do miracles, and the Jews, your, your people would still reject him? Yes. And you wrote that down about him? Yes. He's quoting Isaiah 53, verse 1. How do you know this, Isaiah? The Holy Spirit is revealing it to me. You catch it? Did you guys catch it or no? Okay. Now the second part, John 12, 39 to 41. Here's where you should get blown away. That was Isaiah 53, 1 that he quoted. Now John 12, 39 to 41, NIV. Watch here. Watch here. Second part, John 12, 39 to 41. For this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, and elsewhere Isaiah said, this was God's punishment on them, his judgment on them for refusing to accept the revelation already given to them, so he hardened them. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Now notice what John says. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Wow. Not only did he write about Jesus, spoke about Jesus, he saw the glory of Jesus. He saw the glory of Jesus as the God-man. Jehovah on the throne and the Messiah to come. He saw Messiah coming and dying for our sins and being glorified and exalted. Everyone got it? You getting it? Okay. It's not again, don't don't be upset with me. I I like I said, I'm gonna say it again. To me, King James, perfect words of God in English. But for for the sake of those who may not be familiar with the language and it's kind of hard, I will use other translations just because I want you to get the point. For me, I need you to get the point. And if a translation a different translation will help you get the point faster, so be it. Because I want you to get the point, okay? So let's stick with the NIV in these instances. Let's just stick with it. Okay, ready? I'm going to show you something else. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Mark 12, 35 to 37. You know what? Hold off on Mark 12, 35 to 37. Hold on, Protestant. Hold off. Sorry, brother. Go to Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. Watch here. Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. It's not going to be a long session because I'm going to open up the Q&A as well. But I'm going to show you some interesting stuff. Romans 10, verses 9 to 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Pay attention. How do you get saved? How are you justified? How are you declared righteous and made righteous? Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and have no doubt in your heart. God raised him from the dead. And then verse 10 says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So if I confess Jesus is Lord as a sign that in my heart I have no doubt God raised him from the dead, I am saved, I am justified, I am declared righteous, I am made righteous, right? Everyone with me there? Confessing Jesus is Lord, a public confession, not something in your heart, something verbally, right? Publicly, in front of witnesses. All right. Mark 12, 35 to 37. Mark 12, 35 to 37. 
And I have YouTube sessions on this. What was the religion of the prophets? I'm going to open it up right after this for about 10 minutes Q&A. And then we'll be done for tonight. Mark 12, 35, 37. Do I have time yet? Yeah, While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? Pay attention. David himself speaking by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed this to David. Speaking by the Holy Spirit, David the prophet declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself called him, called the Messiah, called Christ Lord. How then can he be a son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. Guys, I don't think it's on kid. Jesus said, David confessed with his mouth and wrote with his pen, the Messiah was his Lord. The Holy Spirit revealed to David, Messiah is coming and he is your Lord who sits enthroned at God's right hand. And David confessed Jesus the Messiah as Lord a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. Because he's quoting Psalm 110 verse 1. Psalm 110 verse 1 was written a thousand years before Jesus. Everyone with me there? Okay, now, remember the second part, believe in your heart, God raised them from the dead? Okay, let's go to Acts 2, 24 to 28. Acts 2, 24 to 28. Acts 2, 24. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Acts 2, 24, 28. Pay attention here. Peter filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Spirit filled. Preaches the first Christian sermon and gets 3,000 Jews saved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice what he preaches. But God raised him, the Messiah Jesus, from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Notice again, he quotes a Psalm of David. Another time David is cited. David said about him, David said about Jesus. Notice Peter saying, David said, wrote about Jesus. And what did David write about Jesus? I saw the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Hades, Sheol, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So now Peter said, a thousand years ago, David wrote this psalm. He, he spoke and wrote this psalm. Here Peter quotes Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. And he says, David wrote that psalm about Jesus. But Peter, what's this psalm about? This psalm is David seeing that God's Holy One was not left dead, but was <clears throat> preserved from corrupting. Preserved from corrupting. He was not left dead. <clears throat> That's what David wrote about the Messiah. So now let's pick it up from Acts 2, 29 to 31. Pay attention. Acts 2, 29 to 31. Let's see if you catch it. Acts 2, 29 to 31. Going back to the King James again, huh? Watch here. Peter now cites Psalm 16, 8 to 11, and then look at his exposition, his interpretation. And I want to make sure everyone gets it. Lisa, everyone get it. Acts 2, 29 to 31. Come on, guys. It's okay, first last. You want to help your brother? Don't, don't hesitate. Don't sit there. And wait for the rapture. That's what I'm going to read. Okay, read with me. Everyone read. Fellow Israelites. Now, Peter quotes that psalm. And he says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died. Patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. Now, what is his point? David's been dead for a thousand years. His body has decayed, corrupted. So David could not be talking about himself. You and I both agree. This cannot be about David. David died, was buried, his grave is with us. His body's decayed. Right? So then who was David talking about, Peter? Watch here. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him. God promised David. 
an oath swore to him that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. Whoa! That he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, and literally, nor did his body see decay. Whoa! Peter, you're saying God revealed to David, the Holy Spirit revealed to David, that the Messiah would be his physical descendant from his line, and that he'd be raised from the dead? That's what David was told. I'm not moving on until it sinks in. Did it sink in? Help me out. Does it sink in? It? But I don't think it's sunk in completely. You know why? I don't, you know why I don't think it's sunk in completely? Because let's reread Acts 231 one more time. No, the Lord at uh, Jesus' right hand was the Holy Spirit. No, no faith love. Faith love, you know I'm going to block you for pontificating again, right? The Lord wasn't at Jesus' right hand because Psalm 110.5 is about Jesus at the Father's right hand. Don't make that mistake again and then disturb me so I have to correct your misinterpretation. You know better. Acts 2.31, pay attention. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. Folks, I don't know if it's sunk in. David didn't simply know about the resurrection. He saw it before it happened. Seeing what was to come, God revealed the future and allowed David to see in the spirit the Messiah being raised from the grave. Seeing what was to come, he spoke about it. Just like Daniel saw with his eyes in a vision, Jesus, the Son of Man, riding the clouds of heaven to the Father. He saw the resurrection. Do you know why that's astonishing? None of Jesus' disciples saw Jesus come out of the grave. They, they discovered the grave empty, but none of them was there to see how he came out. But David did see it because the Spirit revealed to David, look, that's your son, your physical son. Look, he's being raised to life. Never to die again. He saw the resurrection and he wrote down and wrote it. You, re you understand? Okay, now let's continue. Acts 2 32 to 35. Acts 2 32 to 35. Acts 2 32 35. We're down 90. It's all right. If even one person, we preach to one person from our heart for the glory of Jesus. But I'm hoping we get to that 900. Acts 2, 32 to 35. Now watch here. Exactly what we said. So there's hope for you and me, right? If a murder and adulterer can be saved by Jesus, Jesus can save anyone who turns to him. Now, Louisa, read this. Acts 2, 32 to 35. God has raised his Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Now, again, quoting David. For David, and he quotes Psalm 110, 1, that Jesus quoted. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. There's the gospel. David saw the death and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, his physical descendant. David also saw the Messiah being raised to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. And David not only saw all that, he wrote it down, he confessed, this is my Lord, Jesus is Lord, and God raised him from the dead. But that's how Paul said we're saved. Paul said you're saved when you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. David confessed Jesus is Lord and believed and saw God raising him from the dead. So wait, David received the gospel? The same gospel that Paul preached in Romans 10? The same gospel that saves you? And David received that gospel and even wrote that gospel down? Did you catch it? He wrote that gospel down? So what was the gospel that saves you? Confess verbally. In front of people, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. 
David confessed to millions because he wrote it down for millions to read till this day. He is my Lord who did not see decay, whose soul was not abandoned to the grave, to Sheol, to Hades, because God raised him up to sit with God in heaven on God's throne at his right hand. And that's my Lord. That's my Messiah. That's Jesus. David saw that, confessed it, and wrote it down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So was David a Christian? Yes. Did he worship Jesus the Messiah? Yes. Did he confess Jesus Maya as his Lord? Yes. Did he believe that Jesus the Messiah died and was raised again to life and sit enthroned in heaven? Yes. Then he knew the Messiah Jesus is his Lord, his God, his Savior, and he trusted in him. Right? Okay, now let me show you something else about Abraham. Romans 4, verses 1 to 3. We're almost done. We're going to open up Q&A for a few minutes and we're done. Romans 4, verses 1 to 3. Watch this. The gospel that Paul preached is the gospel that God preached to Abraham and to David. Now watch this. Romans 4, verses 1 to 3. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. If David, um, if Abraham was saved by his works, then he could boast. Look how righteous I am. Look how good I am. Look at my deeds. My deeds saved me. But what does Paul say? What does Paul say? But he can't boast before God. Why? Because verse 3. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Notice he says, Abraham was not saved, was not justified by his works. Because the Old Testament says, Abraham was declared righteous and righteousness was credited to him by his faith and belief and trust in God. And Paul says, that's how you're saved. When you trust in God, Jesus Christ, when you believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, right, and have faith in Jesus Christ, God will then declare you righteous and credit you with a righteous standing before him. Just like Abraham, right? Just like Abraham. So how was Abraham justified, saved? By believing, trusting in God. How are you justified? How are you saved? How are you declared righteous, made righteous? How do you attain a righteous standing before God? By believing, trusting, hoping, having faith in God. Right? Oh, but hold on. Let's go to Genesis 15, verses 4 to 6. This is a reminder of yesterday. Genesis 15, verses 4 to 6. Because here, Paul is quoting Genesis 15, verse 6. Pearl, don't ask me these questions. If you're going to call in with that question, I'm going to block you. Your questions better be relevant and important or I'm going to block you. Okay, Genesis 15, verses 4 to 6. Luisa, everyone, and we're, we're basically done. We have one more passage. We're done. Okay. Okay, guys, focus. Pay attention. This is where Paul quotes from. He quotes Genesis 15, verse 6. But let's read the context. Then the word of the Lord, the word of Jehovah came to him, Abraham. The word came to Abraham and told him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, Jehovah, and he credited to him as righteousness. Now, if you remember yesterday, here you have the word of the Lord, word of Jehovah, appearing to Abraham, making a promise to Abraham. And when Abraham believed the word, Abraham believed the promise of the word by trusting what the word told him. By believing what the word told him, he was credited as righteous. Guys, did you catch it? Did you catch it? Abraham was declared righteous because he had faith. He trusted in and believed the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord, because that's who came to him in Genesis 15, 4 to 6. The word of the Lord came to him. In other words, he was declared righteous and saved because he saw Jesus, believed in Jesus, and trusted in the promise of Jesus, the word who, became, who later became flesh. And how are you declared righteous? By believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, the word who became flesh.
So Abraham was saved and justified the same way you are. Both Abraham and us believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, hope in Jesus, the word who became flesh, who at that time hadn't become flesh yet. And now, finally, 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12, and we're done. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12. And I'm going to open up the Q&A. Oops, I got a chance. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 12. Okay. Guys, this is it. This is the icing on a cake and we're done. But you got to pay attention. Concerning the salvation, what salvation, Peter? The salvation of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. This salvation that we've been preaching, we apostles, Peter and the rest. Concerning the salvation... The prophets, all of them, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances, trying to find out the exact time and situation which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Wow. I don't think you read it. It was Jesus' spirit, Christ's spirit in the prophets, speaking through the prophets and revealing to the prophets Messiah's coming to suffer for your salvation and enter his glory. Whose spirit told them? The spirit of Christ. That's verse 11. Which the spirit of Christ in them. In who? The prophets. Christ's spirit, his Holy Spirit that belongs to him and the Father was in them. Revealing to them, Christ is coming to suffer and enter his glory to save you. Verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told, now been fulfilled and been revealed to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent to heaven. Even angels look long to look into these things. Do you believe that? Do you believe what Peter said? It was Christ's spirit. The Holy Spirit that's united to Christ. The Holy Spirit who's inseparable from Christ. The Holy Spirit whom Christ sends and instructs to instruct us. Christ's Spirit was in the prophets in the Old Testament telling the prophets, Hey, Messiah's coming. Messiah Jesus is coming to suffer for your salvation and to enter his glory. And they wrote about it and God preserved it as a witness for us today. Did you catch it? So if you believe the New Testament, all the prophets were told. Some were given more details than others, but this had, they held in common. We will be saved by the Messiah. Messiah will save us. Our hope is in him. Our trust in it is in him. Our love is for him. He saves us. So they knew about the Messiah and trusted in him. They're all Christians. That was their faith. That was their religion. They did it all for the Messiah Jesus, who later became flesh. For the Blessed Virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did I answer your question, folks? What was the religion? Not Islam, not Buddhism, not Hinduism, not any otherism. They were Christians. Everyone got it? If you got it, officially this session is over. My Skype is open for sincere, genuine questions. Give them the Skype number, please, if you can, first and last. And let me give you some articles here. Are you now ready for the articles? Here are the articles. Article here, number one. All right. Who was the child of sacrifice? Abraham or, I'm sorry, who was the child of sacrifice? Isaac or Ishmael? Article number one. Save this. What else did I want to get you? Okay. Give them the... the Name of my Skype, and you can call, or you can ask me a question in text. You can call me or ask me a question in text as I look for other articles. Save these articles and study them. Here's this other one. Save this and study this. Okay, second one. There's no questions. We'll end it, folks. You can call me for a question or text your question in. 
This is the other article. Save it. The perfect to come is Jesus Christ. In light of 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. It's not the canon because the canon hasn't given us the ability to perfectly know as we are known. When the perfect comes, we will no longer see dimly, see, see clearly. Our thinking will become perfect. It won't be tainted and corrupted by sin and tradition. So the perfect that comes in 1 Corinthians 13, 10 is Jesus in 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8. I don't know. What do you mean, messianics? Boon Heng Ong, I do believe there will be a third temple. But not all Christians believe that because they don't believe the Bible clearly teaches. But if you're asking me, my understanding of prophecy, and I can be wrong, there will be a third temple which the Antichrist comes in and defiles before Jesus comes down. Christos Anesti, why do you ask me the same question I've answered a thousand times? Who are you doing it for? For you? Because you got the answer, right? I don't know what you mean. What happened to the gospel message from the Old Testament? Nothing happened. It's there. Yeah, Michael, because you agree with me. Other Christians think we're wrong. No, Cloudy. It's not his most important work. It's all important. His life of obedience, his death and intercession. One is not more important than the other. Don't ever compartmentalize the work of Christ. It's all equally important. Right? Because I don't get it, Christos and SD. We answer that in Discord. Do you remember? SDA, Matthew 5, 17, 18. So that's what I'm saying. Are you asking because you didn't get a clear answer or you got a clear answer? Yeah. If you guys want to talk to me, the Skype is there. If not, I'll answer questions in the text. We'll take a couple more minutes. It depends. Christ is almighty. Did you come now because you don't want to come to hear the session and you decided to come at the end? Hmm? John R., it depends. If those messianics say everyone has to keep the Torah, not to be saved, but as a way of working out their sanctification, then they're wrong. What are they saying exactly, John R., about keeping the Torah? What are they saying exactly? You must keep the Torah now that you're saved? Or if you want to keep those aspects of the Torah that you don't have to, what are they saying exactly? Help me out. So no one wants to call on Skype? They're scared. That's fine. Not really. No, I can't. Okay. Do you want to call me resurrected eyes or do you want to just. Do you want to. Someone's asking me, he set aside his authority in Matthew 28 18. But he did exercise his authority. Uh, you're obviously confused, resurrected eyes. The authority he set aside is his kingly authority. Though he had divine power on earth to do ministry. And to perform miracles in union with the Holy Spirit, he wasn't functioning as king, but as a servant. So don't confuse his authority as king, which he did not have on earth, with his divine ability to do miracles in union with the Father and the Spirit, resurrected eyes. Did you get that? You understand the answer? Hope you did. Uh, Christ is almighty. Because you didn't care about it, you missed an hour session proving that all the prophets were Christians who believed in Jesus. So don't ask me a question because that's what you get for assuming. Okay. I even said in the first part, don't think it's about Islam. You're not going to learn about your faith because I'm going to the Bible. I just spent an hour proving Abraham, <clears throat> Isaiah, David, all the prophets knew of Jesus, believed in Jesus and were Christians. And that was their religion. But because you didn't want to hear about Islam, don't ask me a question. Sit out. No. Memiophobe. Isaiah 48, 16 is not a conclusive proof text for the Trinity. It's not a conclusive proof text for the Trinity. Okay. Don't ever do that again. Sit down in a session because you think it's only about Islam. As if you don't need to know about Islam to reach them for Christ. Who cares about them damn Muslims, right? That's the attitude. Good for you, brother. Okay. Memiophobe. 
To answer your question again, to answer your question, Isaiah 48, 16 is not a conclusive proof text for the Trinity, but it does prove at least two divine persons. It doesn't necessarily prove three persons, but it does prove two divine persons. You have, you have God and the Spirit empowering the agent who's speaking. Now, is that agent God or is it Isaiah? That's the debate. Don't ever base your doctrine on a passage that's debatable because it can be Isaiah saying, hear the words of Jehovah and know these are his words because Jehovah sent me by the Spirit to tell you his words. But you still have two divine persons, Jehovah and the Spirit, not necessarily three. No, John R., it's not referring to the old Torah. Don't chime in and tell me about 1 John 3, 4. I asked you, are they saying you must keep the Torah for sanctification? 1 John 3, 4 is not just talking about the Torah of Moses. It's talking about the commands, the law given through Jesus, not just the law of Moses. Don't ever misquote 1 John 3, 4. Never. So I'm going to give you another chance because I think you're one of those messianics, but too afraid to say it. Are they saying... You need to keep the Torah for sanctification. Even Gentiles must keep the Torah, the dietary restrictions of the Mosaic Covenant. Yes, Riaz. In fact, Isaiah 53, 12, Riaz. Quote Isaiah 53, 12, but Luke 22, 37. Isaiah 53, 12, Luke 20. Mevio, you're going to leave right after this because you didn't understand me told you Isaiah is the one who said he was there from the beginning. Isaiah is quoting Jehovah who said that and then he's saying now no I am telling you the words of Jehovah don't try hard to prove a passage that's going to embarrass you don't do that. Don't Listen guys let me tell you something. If you want to get on my bad side don't you ask me questions you don't want answers for then you're being dishonest and wickedly deceitful because you just want me to affirm what you believe don't ask a question that you don't want an honest answer for. All right? Luke 22, 37. Do it again, man. Please make my day. Please. And you wonder why I get angry with people who wickedly, dishonestly ask questions they don't want answers for. They just want to have their own biases confirmed. Luke, Luke 22, 37. No, you weren't. You're were trying to show it's Isaiah because the speaker says, it's trying to show, well, can't be Isaiah. Was Isaiah there from the beginning? You were not listening, were you? Luke 22, 37. Riaz, listen to this. And you wonder why I get angry, guys. Honestly, you wonder why. Luke 22, 37. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was re reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So Riaz, Jesus quotes Isaiah 53, 12, in light of his upcoming crucifixion where he'll be nailed between two malefactors. Did you get your answer, Riaz? Luke 22, 37, quoting Isaiah 53, 12, as being fulfilled on the night of betrayal where he'd be crucified next to two criminals. Did you catch that, Rias? Did you get your answer? Did you get your answer? Yes or no? Rias took a break. He, he's, he's, he's a rapture. The guy asked me a question, doesn't respond. I have no, no idea what you mean after this guy. Where's Rias? Here, I'm going to block Rias because he's not listening. Hold on. Bye-bye, Rias. Bye bye, friend. Sorry, bro. Bye bye. No, where is he? He asked me a question and he goes, Hold on. Where's this guy? How do I block him? Hold on. Sorry. Okay, guys. Any other questions? I don't believe in a rapture before the tribulation. We go through it by the grace of God and He preserves us. No, I can't explain Deuteronomy 22, 20, 21. Ask someone else to explain it, brother.
So what took you 20 minutes to respond to my question to you, Riaz? You're on another channel, Riaz? Now let me test you out, Riaz. Oh, so work is more important than listening to me. Let me ban this guy. You better quit right now and live by faith. You don't need work, friend. All you need is faith. Anyway, but you got your answer, right, Riaz? You got your answer? You better quit, buddy. Okay. No more questions going once. I'll answer Deuteronomy 22 in another session. God willing. Not today. Any other questions? You got enough information today to go back, re-listen, to become second nature. They were all Christians. Abraham was Christian. Isaac was Christian. Jacob was Christian. They were all Christians, according to Jesus, his apostles, and the inspired New Testament. You got your answer? I'll, answer, I'll talk about the transfiguration some other time. But I'll take one more question. If not, we're done. You got two sessions today. God willing, more Jesus willing, as long as we remain indoors quarantine. I'll be back tomorrow if the Lord wills. Yes, the reason why Christos Anesti is because one feature of the New World Translation is they try to translate different Greek words with different shades of meaning. Because you have different Greek words that are typically translated as good in English, right? For example, they do that with the words for love in Greek. You want me there? They do that with the words, words for love in Greek. You have agape and you have phileo. And so what the New World Translation does... It tries to translate these words differently to signify to their readers it's not the same word. Can I give you an example of that? Christos Anesti. So that's why in one place it says, I am the fine shepherd. And another place, they'll translate a Greek word as good, even though that Greek word in John, fine, can also mean good. Because it's different Greek words. They try to translate it with different shades of meaning. In order to signify to the readers, it's not the same word. You with me there? Okay. Let me give you an example how they do it with the words for love. Guys, there are several words for love in the Greek New Testament. Agape is one and phileo. Okay. Now watch this. John 3.35 in the New World Translation of Joe's Witnesses. Yeah, do hit that like button. John 3.35. Watch here. So that's why they do it. Now, they don't always do it for noble reasons. A lot of times they mistranslate to corrupt the Bible in order to hide the fact that the Bible exposes their doctrines as being satanic and false. John 3.35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hands. So here it's agape. Are you quoting the New World Translation? Yes. Now go to John 5.20. John 5.20. Now I don't know if they changed it in the updated edition because they revised their translation. They have a 2013 edition. Now John 5.20. Notice in 3.35 it says the Father loves the Son. That is agape. But notice 5.20. For the Father has affection for the Son. Why the difference? Mike, you have a question? Call me, man. Don't be scared. I'm not going to hurt you. Do you see the difference here? John 3.35 in the New World Translation says the Father loves the Son. But in the New World Translation, John 5.20, it says the Father has affection for the Son. Because in John 5.20, it's phileo. But in John 3.35, it's agape. But that too doesn't follow because these words often are synonymous. They overlap in meaning. So phileo can mean love like agape does, right? So good question. I hope you got your answer. No questions. I'm going to count to 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. All right. Hit the like button. Subscribe. I know it's going to be hard for us financially, but let's take a step of faith. Let's trust God to provide for our needs, to keep us healthy. Pray for my daughters and I. Pray for the provision and pray for the work to continue in spite of the panic. We do not panic. We trust in King Jesus. Christ is risen, risen indeed.
right? We love the Lord Jesus. May he wash us and purify us and seal us and our loved ones, my daughters. Lord willing, see you tomorrow if the Lord wills. I hope this blessed you. Listen to this. I gave you ample proof. They were all Christians. And God wants you to call yourself a Christian. If you live up to that name, don't call yourself a Christian and shame Jesus. Don't call yourself Christian and be addicted to gambling or an alcoholic, addicted to drugs or sexually immoral or a pervert. No. Okay. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Too bad, Thomas. You're too late. That's what happens for being a doubting Thomas. Take care. Christ is risen.